Hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being with us today and joining this webinar uh, organized by School Education Gateway European Toolkit for Schools, which is running a webinar series on promoting inclusive education and tackling early school leaving. Uh, so my name is Ina and uh, together with me, uh, they are my colleagues today, Isminia and Eleonora, and we're supporting this webinar. Um, today we'll have a very interesting discussion on the school systems that need to change in order to tackle early school leaving and improve social inclusion in education and society. And in our speaker panel today, we have Erna Neres Wirth, uh, who is Associate Professor and Head of the Education Sciences Group at Vienna University of Economics and Business. She has designed, conducted and published numerous studies on education and inequality. Uh, also in our discussion, Dr. Pierre Cornhall, uh, he is an independent author, lecturer and consultant in school development and education. Um, so I'm very curious to listen to our speakers today. And uh, as usual, I want to point out that our sessions are recorded and you'll be able to review the recording on the webinar page in the next couple of days. Um, we'll be also publishing the slides of our speakers, so we'll be able to come back to it and review the information given in the webinar as well. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free at any point of this webinar to post them in the chat box and we'll try to address as many questions as possible in the end of the webinar. So Erna, if you are ready, I'm happy to give you the floor and start this webinar. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Inna, and hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me to speak on what we consider to be an extremely important topic in the field of education. It's a great honor and I'm happy to, to be here. As you know, I'm Erna Neyert-Zwirt and I'm one of the co-authors of the report called Structural Indicators for Inclusive Systems in and Around School. Today, I would like to give you a brief insight into what this, re is re this report is about and also show you how you can think about the structural indicators in your school and in your country. Just for your information, we use the terms inclusive education, inclusion in education and inclusive systems interchangeably. So what is meant by an inclusive system? What does a school with an inclusive system look like? And what are the structural indicators which show if your school and also the educational policy in a country is inclusive or not? These questions are the questions we shall be dealing with today in this webinar. There are two points I'd like to mention. Firstly, when we talk about this framework of structural indicators, we are not talking about a legal obligation to implement them. Rather, they are intended to contribute to a more inclusive system, which will in turn help to prevent early school leaving. In fact, we can see this as a main goal of these indicators to provide structures for all learners so that they feel integrated and not be driven by feelings of isolation that may lead to early school leaving. Because as you all know, the lack of formal education is something that has a really negative impact on the individual itself, but also on a society. And of course, early school leaving is at the root of many social problems. So, whom is this report meant for? Well, it is intended for national policymakers, evaluation experts, regional and local authorities, school leaders and teachers. And of course, I also want to say hello to my students in Vienna. We wrote this report for all agencies and institutions who are interested in making their school or their school system more inclusive. And I have to say that the indicators we developed are all based on profound research findings. Here you can see seven dimensions for inclusive systems and how these work towards preventing early school leaving. And I would like to give you an example of what can happen and sadly so often does happen to students who find themselves in a system which is not inclusive. I shall use the story of Ismail today, who was a typical vulnerable student as an illustration. 
while I am telling the story, you will see on your screen structural indicators as examples. Ismail was part of my longitudinal, longitudinal qualitative study on early school leavers. He was born in Vienna. At the time we interviewed him first, he was 18 years old. His parents grew up in Turkey, and you probably know that a large population in Austria has Turkish backgrounds. It was apparent from the first interview that Ismail spoke very fluent German and, he, that, and that he was in fact bilingual. This ability, as well as his interest and potential talent for art was, as we shall see later, not appreciated, which brings us immediately to a key principle of an inclusive system, namely building on strengths of students and not on their deficits. So next, Ismail's social economic situation was restricted. So we see that overcoming poverty related barriers to education is vital for an inclusive system. There are a list of indicators in our report, for example, that children get breakfast at school. There should be targeted individual support, which can include financial support, for example, free school materials. These are, of course, just examples. The report offers a collection of many more possible indicators. Here it is important to mention that the indicators can be continuously adjusted to the respective situation in your school or in your country. Because of Ismail's social restrictions and also the language barriers, his parents were not able to help with his schoolwork. This, of course, occurs in many immigrant families, which is why it is so important that an inclusive system recognizes the significance of family support, especially for vulnerable students or those who are marginalized. For example, this can be th through family support systems like community centers. But when the parents are for some reason not able to attend the school actively, then the system should provide an outreach approach. At the end of the first class in primary school, Ismail moved with his family to another district. Again, our report shows that in such cases, there should be close cooperation between schools, induction programs and targeted support for children who are facing difficulties during transition from one school to the other and adapting to the new school environment. Cross-school cooperation is a key feature of positive transitions across schools, especially for marginalized students. Students with lower ability and lower self-esteem have more negative school transition experiences, which in turn leads to lower levels of attainment and higher levels of depression. An an anxious students also experience more bullying, never forget, that school climate is a key indicator for any successful transition in schools or between schools. Well, Ismail didn't receive enough of this and in the new school he began to be bullied because his German was not perfect yet. Bullying is a form of violence and often plays a role in early school leaving. This is also a strong argument for a holistic approach, which means focusing not only on academic education, but also on social, emotional and physical needs of students and their parents, and also being aware of signs of discrimination. This is philosophy. This philosophy is behind every inclusive system. At his new school, Ismail was finally able to join a support class in German. He learned German quickly. Unfortunately, it seems that this support came too late. One of the indicators which refers to this problem, as well as those mentioned above, in, is the need for support for teachers to develop their cultural diversity competence in working with minorities and migrants. This training would help to prevent stereotyping prejudice, labeling and other forms of discrimination. 
It is also important that teachers have the same expectations from all their students and do not lower these expectations when it comes to marginalized groups, as this is also a form of discrimination. So, in spite of Ismail's progress in learning German, he had to repeat the second primary school class. From this point on, his school career became an odyssey. In the new middle school, he even had to repeat two classes. That means that by the end of these eight years at school, he already had to, re to repeat three classes. We all know that removing children from their own age group has a strong demotivating effect. It is in fact recommended that children should be in the same age group as their peers because then they feel more included. Unfortunately, repeating grades is still widespread and many countries seem to be resistant to changing this system. It seems also that Ismail was often silenced. In fact, he told us that one teacher said to him, sit in the back row and be quiet. This is a form of violence. It is, of course, not physical violence, but is an, it is an exclusion, which is often accepted as a normal course of events. And as we know from many interviews and other qualitative studies, this is still used by some teachers as a sanction. The sociologist Pierre Bourdieu described this as symbolic violence. As happens with many school leavers, Ismail had started to truant. We know from research that responses to early warning signals like truancy should be fast and include the pupils, the parents and the professionals. Also, individual action plans have to be created to help and guide at risk students and their families. Obviously, the school staff plays a key role in recognizing early signs of disengagement. And just as important are multidisciplinary teams that operate for early warning and quick intervention. But multidisciplinary teams are also important in regard to health and welfare issues in education. So, after this, Ismail got pushed from one educational institution to another, including training programs. By this time, he had already become a chronic truant. This led to his being dismissed from several programs. Of course, it is clear that somebody with Ismail's background that is an early school leaver is more at risk of being negatively judged and in fact stigmatized. I'm not going into all the details what happened afterwards. Briefly, Ismail never really found his feedback in education or in society. Eventually, because of his history and again, the stigmatization that went with him, he withdrew himself more and more from society. He developed unrealistic ideas of becoming, for example, a musician or a star poker player and because he was a sensitive person, he also suffered guilt feelings about being a burden to his mother and he became severely depressed at the end. I would like to remind you that we are talking about a boy who had above average intelligence and spoke German as well as most Austrians when we interviewed him. A sad part of Ismail's story is that he showed a lot of interest and talent for art, which unfortunately was not encouraged enough. Here is a collage Ismail created when he described his vision of his future life. If you look at it, you will notice that he did not connect the different segments. The collage shows a segment that obviously illustrates his hostile group the police and politicians. You can see that he even crossed out these images. This could be associated with a decreased democratic awareness and a loss of trust in public institutions. It is very interesting to see what Ismail has left out. All areas of work, school and further education. This could be interpreted in a way 
that he was already at an advanced stage of distancing himself from these fields. But what we researchers also noticed is that art was drawn very large and even framed. In fact, he could express his visions very clearly through his artwork. I would emphasize, as we saw previously, that a number of studies have reported that arts programs can be important to enhance feelings of inclusion. I shall end the rather tragic story of Ismail, who for us represents far too many early school leavers, by quoting from our report, which I think sums up how inclusive systems in school should work, in particular in regard to pupils who are vulnerable. Pupils with learning difficulties or those who face personal, social or emotional challenges often have too little contact with education staff or other adults to support them and their, their talents. They need easy access to teachers and other professionals who support them in their educational and personal development. They also need guidance and mentoring together with cultural and extracurricular activities to broaden their learning opportunities. The report that I have been talking about in this webinar is integrated in the European Toolkit for Schools in two ways. Firstly, you can download it as a full report to read and secondly, to use as a self-assessment tool. You can find the self-assessment tool in the European Toolkit for Schools in the section about. Here you can see the results of one self-assessment in an Austrian school. The result is shown by a traffic light system. Green means your school has already implemented many of the structural indicators of an inclusive system. Yellow means your school is already to some extent exclusive, but there is still room to expand further. Red means your school is still in an early stage of becoming inclusive and has some way to go. You will notice that the school has already achieved a lot in section parental involvement and family support. However, the school is still at an early stage regarding the whole school approach to inclusive systems. As part of the self-assessment, you will be given a personalized report with examples of ways to further improve your system. And please always bear in mind that the goal is to make school a place where all students want to stay and become lifelong learners. I'd like to say that we as, and also the European Commission see the implementation of inclusive systems as a kind of work in progress it is not a fixed system and it is obviously not going to happen overnight. The report and also the toolkit, which includes, besides the self-assessment tool, many other good practices to make your school an inclusive place. Well, thank you very much for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much, Erin. It was really inspiring. So we will open the discussion straight away. Um, per, would you like to, uh, to take the lead? Yes, um, and I would like to share my slides. Yeah. Loading. Um, like to just to thank the organizers for this uh, for for having me. It's a great honor. Um, okay, so um, if everyone sees my slides, I will start just to give a few comments on what what Erna said about the indicators for inclusive systems, and I will give a, 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 a just a sure a few thoughts about the these these um, indicators and then I will have we I and Arna will have a discussion and we will then open the floor for questions. So uh, what I wanted to say is that these indicators that we um, because both Arna and I are part of the editorial board for the toolkits for schools these are included here so to be used as a tool it's something that you can use to investigate your own school uh, it is important always to remember that it's not a manual, it's not a guidebook for how to do things, but it is something that can challenge you. That is, if you use the assessment tool or read a re report, you will probably challenge, be challenged. You would see that 
it says something. It says something about you and your school that would be maybe challenging. And this could be you know, the first step towards seeing things differently. You know, there is no chart, there is no change in systems if we don't accept that there can be a challenge that we can have a problem. If we think we are perfect, there is no way to change. Uh, and I would like also then to connect to the last week's webinar. I don't know how many of you who, who viewed the last webinar. If you haven't, please take a look at it. Because that was also very much about a tool that you can use to see yourself and your organization, your school or your system in another way. But when they were talking about how students could make inquire could be researchers of teaching that teachers are, are making really to involve students and that is very much what these structural indicators also are about how do you create the environment the whole school approach where uh, every voice of every person in this uh, community is really heard um, I know that Erna has some students probably listening and I, she asked me how is this working in Sweden that is a system so I thought that I would just give a short presentation or short this slide just talk a little bit about the situation in Sweden as an as an answer to that question because we are having this European web page and we have very many different countries with different systems and sometimes we point out and one system or another as a good system, another as a bad system. I think it's very important to see that we we have strength in every system and we have weaknesses in, in every system. When it comes to Sweden, if you look at it superficially on the from the outside, maybe somebody would say you have a very inclusive school system, you have a very high ambitions and for some parts we have that. We have had an thought about inclusion for a very very long time it was it was really what our school system was built around starting in from the 1940s and forward so in that respect we have for for example we have had free lunches in schools for a very very long time it's not no kid has to get to go hungry in a swedish school because there will, will be lunch if we still need to provide breakfast to poor kids in some schools but still we have free materials for everyone. We don't we don't use great repetition and stuff like this. I'm telling you this because there is a like a there's a strong notion. There is a strong uh, emphasis on inclusion on on um, on every student's right for a good education in the system and in the legislation around it. But the realization of all these high ambition in the legislation and in the history of the school system that could be a totally different story because we are also a system that is very diverse. It is very decentralized and they also marketize. We have different forces in the school system. How the school works actually in one municipality is not the same as it works in another municipality. How one school leader, uh, could you say, translates the legislation and the curricula or how a teacher does this in one school is of course different than in another school. And this is what we are facing in every system, a great variation. And when you come to the word of, to the inclusion as such, if we look at inclusion in a more narrow context, like in uh, is children taken out of classes of the normal classes to be treated in special, you know, special education classes and stuff like that. That is one definition of inclusion and exclusion. You can exclude children by putting them in special classes. Um, that sometimes in Sweden we have the, we have the, the notion, the the ideology of the school system is to be included, but we still have exclusion, of course. But this very good thing about inclusion that we should bring all kids to be together. That is also sometimes used not for the benefit of children. Some children that actually would benefit from being excluded for some time are not excluded, are not put, are not given maybe the proper training that they would need for a short time outside of a normal class because it's cheaper to have them in the big class. And sometimes because we have a marketized system, actually some students are excluded 
because somebody is running a school for profit and earning money out of the excluded students with special needs. So that, what I'm telling you now is not um, not a horror story and not a d description. I'm just trying to problematize that in every system there are ambitions, but there is also a reality created by the diversity of the system. And what is what I want my point here is that when at the end of the day, the most important thing about all this is that that you in wherever you are, whatever position, if you're in a national uh, legislative politician, political system, or if you're a teacher down in a school or a caretaker in a school, the main thing is how do we treat the people, the kids that we are, that are put in our trust, that we have a child-centered approach is the most important thing here. I have a friend who has worked with the worst, with the children in Sweden that are the most difficult to teach. Those are children that, that are actually locked away because they are a danger to themselves uh, and to their surroundings. I mean, this is really, really, really the, the hardest cases that we have. And he discussed with these kids, he listened to them, he talked to them, and he talked to them in, in um, actually a couple of years. It's a very long study he did. But he could see that were, that were some of them, this exclusion that they were taken out of their um, normal classes and stuff like that, was the thing that made them lose all hope in society, that made them take a way out, take the way out into criminality, into drugs, etc. But for some, actually, the exclusion was what in the end saved them. So what I'm trying to say here is that you don't know what works for all children, but, but you need to know what works for an individual child. You need to have that child-centered approach. That is, the child that you meet in schools, how do they, what do they respond to? That is your responsibility in a way. And why I'm saying this is because I would like to, Erna gave us now a, a framework around Ismail, a story that didn't turn out very well. I would like to point you to towards three actually very, very successful stories about inclusive schools. And those we also have on the toolkit uh, uh, web page. If you saw where Erna was had, having that, um, she showed you where you could find a self-assessment tool. In the same menu, you can also find videos. And if you click on that video, you can go in and you can show the three reports that we have on good practices to tackle early school living. And this, I think, is really, really interesting. And I would strongly recommend everybody that's listened to this to go in to see, to look on these three films. And if you don't have any good, you know, it's Friday night today. And you know, uh, if you don't have any feel good films on your repertoire, on your um, on your Padlet or wherever you look on films say on the Netflix, you, you, you really want three feel good films. This is something that you actually could choose for a Friday evening. Because what you see here are three very different schools in very different settings. It's a school from Kolsva, a um, small town, outside a small town school in Sweden. That you will find another school in Barcelona in Spain. In a totally different circumstances from the Swedish schools, but you will see how they work to make every child. And then you will also see a film from Manchester in England, and you see a story that will make, actually will give you tears when you see how these um, um, teachers and personnel around uh, the kids in that school uh, saves uh, lives as, and saves futures. And that is what you will see. You will see that these are totally different schools. They use totally different approaches. They are in different school systems, but they have one very strong common de de denominator. There's something that is the same in all these free schools. 
as I say, a strong uh, ethical leadership from principles that creates whole, whole school climates where actually uh, every child counts, where uh, children with problems find someone who actually cares for them. It's some places where principals, teachers and other personnel walk that extra mile to make a difference for an individual child and for every individual child in their schools. It's not easy. Nobody is saying that this is easy, but the results for these kids and for society in general uh, is, is profound. It's, it's very, very important. So I would like to kind of, of um, also remind you, because one of the things in the indicators that I think a little bit problematic sometimes is a focus on parents and cooperation with parents. I think that you should absolutely work and cooperate with parents, that you would work with the cultures of the children um, to develop a strong bond between schools and homes and all that. But you need always to remember that for many children in our schools, the school is their only safe place. That is the only place where they meet uh, grown up people that could take care of them, that could show some responsibility to give them some kind of, of um, rest from the chaos that they actually could be living at home. So it's you are their only possibility to meet and create another future for themselves and in society. So that is also one of the reasons why we, we need to make sure that our schools are working, even if the homes are not. And that's the sort of reality, even if we don't like it to be that. Um, yeah, so that was my my final just to just to comment on this. I would like to now uh, leave the presentation, and I would like to to um, to discuss this a bit with Erna uh, first, and then we will let uh, have some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Oh no, when I when I think about this, there is one aspect that is often very mentioned in, in these kind of materials and that the, and also in the European uh, circle, I mean, you know, different Euro European circles and discussions. Everybody's talking about a whole school approach. I also did that. Mm -hmm. What is that? What is meant by a whole school approach? I mean, well, what, actually, what, what's the point? Thank you, Pierre. It was so interesting what we were talking about. Uh, the, the Swedish case, and I absolutely share with you, let me start with this maybe, that mm -hmm. of course there are best practice schools in every country, good practice schools. And um, I would like also that all teacher training students and all teachers and principals work on an inclusive system. And I think also um, that it's also good for teachers to work in an inclusive system because when they work in an inclusive system, in a caring system, they also feel more comfortable. And there is also a dropping out of teacher, a high fluctuation of teachers. And if you work in an inclusive school system, you have it much, it's a much better working place also for teachers. But um, let me come back to your question now. It's about, um, how do we understand a uh, whole school approach? It actually as, uh, includes a philosophy that, in, that the entire school community is included and works together. And what is the school community? Uh, uh, the school leaders, the teaching and non-teaching staff, the learners, parents and families, they all should engage in a cohesive, collective and collaborative way and also cooperate with external stakeholders and the community at, a large, at large. And this is why we also have uh, developed a wide list of indicators on a whole school approach, which you can find in chapter eight of the report. I can just, I just would like to, to, to give you some examples maybe. Yes, um, you do, have to work on a positive school climate and a classroom's climate. So uh, 
what is meant by it. It's, for example, a welcoming environment. When, for example, if I talked about being a, a, a Ismail who was truant, sometimes when students come back to school, they are criticized. And also for these students who are truant, it is very important that they are accepted and they feel welcome again. Or what that a school coordination committee is established in the school to develop an inclusive system and to develop it further. The list of inclusive indicators or structural indicators I showed are only examples. And as I told you, that for each field it's different and every field, and this is also why the community is so important, should develop structural indicators and add some further indicators which are of interest in this special field they are working in. And it's also important, for example, that students and parents are directly rep represented in a coordination committee and so on. Well, it's some, I only gave you some examples. Mm -hmm. Arts education is also one and uh, also supporting extracurricular activities, also with ex external stakeholders or nonprofit uh, institutions or organizations. For example, with Ismail, I can want to come back to this case of our study. Ismail didn't feel recognized or neither in school nor in society. For example, if he worked in a non-profit organization as a volunteer, for example, just reading a book to somebody who uh, doesn't have anybody in a, in, a, in, a, in a home for, for example, older people, he would have felt that he has a position in society and he is worth, uh, uh, he is somebody who, who contributes to society. All these things we are, or all these factors are very important when we talk about whole school approach. Mm. We see that in the, in the movies. I think it's an interesting aspect, aspect of, of this. Um, in the Swedish schools, we can see that they really, for example, they were hiring people that actually went and picked up kids at their homes so that they mm -hmm. come to schools. They, they, made, they walked that extra mile. We saw that in in Barcelona, there was a heavy, heavy work with um, uh, getting parents to be involved in schools, actually in the classrooms. You know, they were really, really uh, working together with the parents in, in this very, uh, you know, uh, uh, vulnerable neighborhood where they were situated. And we can see how the Manchester School was, you know, really working with, um, uh, with, um, uh, with tackling poverty, uh, uh, not at least in, this, in, the mm -hmm. sub, in the surroundings where this, where this school was. So we can see this, you know, network around these, um, these examples. Uh, I would like to have a few different thoughts here. The, the one thing that also connects between, actually between the Manchester example and the Barcelona example is, is art in education, art education. Um, I have a tremendous memory. I don't know. You, we, we actually visited that school, as you remember, of seeing very small children discussing arts um, in both Spanish and Catalan, which neither of those two langu languages were these kids' native language. Mm. I mean, this is an amazing way, I think, of including, of making you know, the wider society relevant and at the same time developing language uh, proficiency among right. kids. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, do you have any idea? Yes, I can. I totally agree. I was also very impressed of the school we, we, we visited in Barcelona. And um, I would like to add something because it, it's, of course, the leadership is very, very important and this is really the extra mile they have to take and but it's also the cooperation with the teachers and every teacher can uh, take over a leadership uh, function in some in some uh, aspect you know and for example if you are arts teacher it's always also possible to to um, to reduce the risk of early school re leaving because what we know from research is that arts education improves the sense of belonging to school, it 
improves the student's self-worth, the self-confidence, self-efficacy. It's also a kind of self-assessment when they are on the stage, for example. And it improves commun communication skills. Also, students feel pride or proud. And it increases the attendance rates. So especially for students with uh, multiple needs or that are not offered or the families can not offer them arts education in the afternoon or in the evening. I think it's a responsibility of our system to offer arts education for all children and for free. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because some, sometimes you say that that schools should also, for the most vulnerable children, sometimes the message is they should learn to, you know, to speak the language of the country, they should learn mathematics and they should learn this and that. Um, but actually, maybe it's very, very, as you say, I, I also think it's very important that they get access to the cultural richness of the society, the things that they don't have at home, that they don't meet at mm -hmm. home. They many many young kids grow up in you know in houses w without any books. Of mm. course, they don't have to meet literature in schools and and so forth and so on. So that is a very important part of education. I would like to ask another question. I just want also first a little mention of if I would say that I am impressed by a system when it comes to inclusion or really. Uh, a system that also takes very good care of it, that its teachers. I would actually look at Finland. I wouldn't go to Sweden. Uh, we see that the Finnish teachers uh, is a very uh, highly um, uh, regarded um, um, profession and that they, they stay on their jobs. They also have very strong support system to give and take care of every child, especially in the young ages and especially their work in the young ages, I think is, is, is impressive and, and that is something that I can recommend people to look into. Um, but I want to ask you one more question before we leave a room for questions from the, from the chat. Um, the role of these indicators and this kind of structural indicators in teacher education, because I know that you use them. So yeah. do you have any, because I can see that this, this could be very important to that, that young stu, uh, teachers coming out into the profession have these kind of tools and preparedness for inclusiveness. I don't know, uh, what, what, what is your experience? Well, I have very good experience with using this uh, this report, but also the toolkit for schools uh, in teacher education. Because our students uh, come from different uh, diverse backgrounds and um, of course they all experience different fields of schools and school culture, school climates, teacher and everything. And actually I think for most of them it's the first time they hear what is an inclusive system. Because in Austria, uh, for example, uh, inclusive means uh, that we are all, we, we talk about uh, people with really high complex needs and, and nothing else. And what is an inclusive system? They really don't know. So, what I have, I, I, my students start with reading the report. I encourage them to read the report and to have a presentation on it. And then we do with I work with them within working groups to identify uh, uh, in regard to their own educational experience, what went well for them and what did not went so well, what could the school have improved. And, in, and then they also, some of them are already uh, teacher training students in school, they have already practiced. And I ask them also, please identify indicators in this school, in this specific field, what uh, what went well and what, what is going well and what is not going well. And I also encourage them, because you said this in the beginning, I always encourage all my students to take over some kind of leadership. Uh, and not only in 30 years or something, because with this basic knowledge of what is an inclusive system and what is a and where you can look up, for example, in the toolkit for schools, so many good practices you can really develop uh, a, a school and to be a, a driver in making our society a better one. Mm. 
and I yeah. think it, it's uh, my students. <laughs> My students also like it, and I think they find it very interesting. And it's also to to look in, in uh, to look outside of Austria into other countries to have the international perspective and to realize, as you said, that each school is a is a, spe a special case and. Mm -hmm. In some schools and in each school, there are good things they do, and teachers are professionalized in a very good way, probably. But maybe parental involvement is not yet established, so we can work on this. So I, th I have very good experience, and I trust my I trust my students that that they will improve our mm. schools to be a more inclusive one. Mm, that is very interesting. Uh, Inna, do we have any questions from the chat room? Thank you. Yes, we do actually. And also we uh, have kind of um, uh, active discussion in the oh. in the chat box going on. And um, oh, one interesting question we thought would be um, interesting to, to address is whether um, what do you think about inclusive education in the current period? So if you could elaborate more on online teaching, for example. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that is, I mean, that is, I mean, that is actually, that is, of course, a tremendously important question. Uh, how do you, and I think that I would just give a reflection from the Swedish perspective. I mean, we didn't close our schools this spring, but of course, very much was distance learning anyway, because as many, many children and teachers were, were sick, we closed down our upper secondary schools. Uh, what we found was that, that, some kind of maturity among teachers to how to use digital devices that they, they they learned like we could say like this there has been some kind of evangelistic um, tonality or approach towards dig digitalization as this solution to things but we now find of course that digitalization is just a tool and every method or every technique you use have its advantages and some disadvantages and the problem here is of course, that we, we we know that some vulnerable children will be uh, hurt badly by this situation. But we have also the interesting result that some kids actually like the situation where they weren't forced to socialize many hours every day with kids because they find that tough. So they actually thrived sitting at home working with in, you know, peace and quietly. So it's a it's a difficult situation, but but Erna, you have probably have something to say about this. Well, um, we are all read in the newspaper that, uh, and we also know it now from the first research results. You know, they are just dropping in. There is almost no research on how uh, teachers and students and parents managed the COVID, uh, the pandemic. Um, but what I think. We re what we know already is that there aren't, this was actually interestingly also my first indicator I showed you, that we have to overcome poverty related barriers in education. And one poverty related barrier was that the students, um, the students sometimes did not have connection uh, to the internet and sometimes also uh, they didn't have the, the necessary device and of course, Many of them did not have their own room to study and, and and what you said, they did not feel safe maybe. So it's also violence increased, home violence increased. And this con this also is this whole pandemic, whole pandemic situation and homeschooling. What does it show us also that we have not been prepared enough in teacher education, in the profession, professionalization of, for, of teachers for this situation. So actually it's a crisis and I think this crisis will help us to further improve our education system because now everything which did not went so well, also maybe in the past, uh, came up to the surface. This is my, inter uh, my uh, perception of this time and of course um, when we talk about parental involvement and bringing them into the school I mean the barrier for p 
parents that normally don't use any technical device because they work as handic in handicraft people or something like that and they are not just used to it, is much higher. So the inequality issues which we have to address in an inclusive system if we want to make it better now has also, so actually it's an encouragement for us to widen or to add some more indicators. What is an inclusive system in pandemic, during pandemic? That's a very interesting question. Thank you, whoever posed this question. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that was one one thing that we actually well, we can say is the the importance. If you look down to the individual teacher, the the enormous importance of staying in touch with all the kids, you know, in any way that you can make it. Um, if they don't have any good kind of connections, they don't. The internet doesn't work. They have a, a full, you know, they're living in in a, in a small flat, and there's a lot of people. It's difficult for them. At least talk to them via normal telephone. In any way, keep them, you know, in the bubble so that when we get the vaccine, when life gets back to normal, they are not, um, you know, socialized away from the educational system. That is very very important. And may I add something also that I, I, I showed you or I, I to, told something about that also in my presentation that uh, emotional counseling is very important, socially and emotional counseling. And this, um, so in the, during these times, I would say an inclusive system must, must uh, need or must establish much more multidisciplinary teams and also take care of students and of course of parents and also of teachers. I mean also the teachers, uh, it was also or is still a crisis for the teachers also because they were not prepared for this. Perfect. Thank you so much for both uh, Bear and Erna for your extensive answers and we have more questions coming in. Uh, we'll try to address as many as possible as time allows. Uh, so the question is, uh, what is the suitable way to teach students in such conditions, especially during online teaching? Um, it's very easy to answer that question, actually. Uh, the way that works. Um, so. Uh, I, I'm not trying to be pretty rude here, but I'm just saying that there are multiple ways of doing this and it depends on what technology you have available. Uh, it is very, I think that most Swedish teachers that have now have, have worked digital you know, during the spring saw that it is important to keep structure. It is important to keep lesson structures, structures maybe break it down to smaller pieces. Um, at, in a classroom, maybe you can take away in a you know a long line of thought that that you finally at the end you know you get you get the, the whole thing together. But 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 the more I'll say piecemeal instruction that occurs online, you, maybe you have to break down you know the the learning events into smaller pieces. But you need to have structure and and, and all that. But in the end, there are as many ways to teach as there are. There are, you know, teachers that there are. There are areas that you can teach about. So you need to find a way that works. That is, I mean, that is a, sounds simplistic, but it's actually the, the 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 strongest element that you can use. And it's no goes also for normal classroom teaching. Use the methods that reach your students, whatever that is. And if that what you don't do, what you do don't work, stop doing it and do something else. Have some well, um, I can't add <laughs> many things to that. I, I totally agree. Of course, it's a big challenge in teacher education to teach our students online. And I would say we had we are now in Austria have the second lockdown. We already learned a lot out of this first lockdown. And one thing is to have a structure to stay uh, to stay uh, engaged and also, well, to see the students online via camera and to get in touch with them. And it's the, sa it's the same uh, thing, which is very, very important for vulnerable students. Well, these are, I mean, in teacher education, I think this is actually what will happen now that we have learned a lot of things, a lot of uh, we had to overcome a lot of challenges and the next step will be to integrate this 
in, te in, in the curricula of teacher trainings or uh, to develop teacher training in another way or in an, in an additional way, in an additional way. But of course, it is a challenge. And as you said, Pear, staying in touch, in contact with the students is the most important thing. And we also know this from early school leaving. The main factor to prevent early school leaving is the social contact having a mentor, having a tutor, having a teacher who trusts that something that the pupil try have, have trust in the pupil that this pupil or student can achieve. So strengthen the self, uh, the uh, strengthen uh, the students in their ways, how they learn and, and, and cognitive, but also in, in an em emotionally. It's very important. So this will be probably central now in, in pandemic times to inform students about this because we can read about this in, in the meanwhile in the newspapers what happens if this does not happen. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Erna. Thanks a lot, Bear. And we have time for one more question, the last one. Um, so the question is, from your perspective, is it possible to implement an inclusive school model with current, not only financial resources? Um, I think that um, one of the, well, or I would say like this, one of the reasons why I showed these three very different schools was to point out that it is possible. Uh, that is that what, wherever you are, uh, you can always make uh, make uh, a school inclusive and, and work better, working with whatever you have. Even also now in the pandemic times, if you, if you, for example, when you meet, not only talk about how the next math mathematics curricula should you know roll out through the, for your students, but you could also meet just to talk about how do we engage, how do we keep our students, uh, you know, in in the uh, socialized into our schools in the educational sector. If you ask other types of questions, I think you can all. I mean, I, I'm not one that would say that the financials on the financial situation is not important because it is. Otherwise, you're you're saying something very uh, mean to our teachers. But it's also true that in all circumstances, you can always um, make a better educational system, a better school, whatever the circumstances. And that is very much about your attitude and how you interrelate as teachers and interrelate with your students. I Thank also you. share this attitude. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we have also developed indicators for the national level for policymakers. I didn't go into this today, but on the other hand, it's right what the pair says that there are so many, many measures that don't you don't need a lot of don't need money for it. It's just, it's about attitudes. I mean, the magic of teaching is isn't yes. it? You you have always right. uh, remember this teacher that actually cared for you in whatever yes. circumstances. That is really what makes the difference. Mm. Yeah. So to our speakers, uh, Bear Erna, if you have uh, anything else to add, please go ahead. Otherwise, I would draw this webinar to the end. No, thanks. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> Yes, the same. Thanks very much and thanks to everyone who listens. OK, excellent. Thank you so much. I really want to thank you for such a rich discussion today. Um, uh, thank you so much to our speakers for being with us and uh, for our audience today and being so active, also engaging a lot during the, the whole webinar in the chat box. So this this was really nice to see. Um, so we have uh, some information, some practical information for uh, our participants. Uh, so you will be able to uh, obtain the certificate of participation within 24 hours. Uh, it's needed to submit the feedback survey. We will right now leave in an announcement the link on the feedback service, so please save it to make sure that it does not disappear once the webinar is over. Um, you need to be uh, registered and logged in on School Education Gateway Teacher Academy platform. This is very important in order to uh, obtain certificate once uh, you submit the evaluation form. So one more time, please make sure to save the link that is just published right now in the announcement in the chat box. Uh, submit your evaluation form, be registered on the platform and get your certificate. 
So thank you so much for being with us today. I hope that everyone enjoyed the webinar and as usual, we will be publishing the recording and the slides of our speakers in the next coming days. So you'll be able to share it with your colleagues or review uh, the webinar again. Um, so th this is it from our side. I want to thank you one more time. Thank you so much and have a nice evening and great weekend ahead. Goodbye.